Section 11 of The Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Siena. There are many plain brick towers erected for defence when this was a free state. The highest is called the Mongio, standing at the foot of the piazza which we went first to see after our arrival. At the entrance of this tower is a chapel open toward the piazza of marble well adorned with sculpture. On the other side is the Signoria, or Court of Justice, well built a la Moderna of brick. Indeed, the bricks of Siena are so well made that they look almost as well as Porphyry itself, having a kind of natural polish. In the Senate House is a very fair hall, where they sometimes entertain the people with public shows and operas, as they call them. Towards the left are the statues of Romulus and Remus, with the wolf, all of brass, placed on a column of ophite stone, which they report was brought from the renowned of Ephesian temple. These ensigns, being the arms of the town, are set up in diverse of the streets and public ways, both within and far without the city. The piazza compasses the facciata of the court and chapel, and being made with descending steps, much resembles the figure of an escalope shell. The white ranges of pavement, intermixed with the excellent bricks above mentioned, with which the town is generally well paved, render it very clean. About this market-place, for so it is, are many fair palaces, though not built with excess of elegance. There stands an arch, the work of Baltazar di Siena, built with wonderful ingenuity, so that it is not easy to conceive how it is supported, yet it has some imperceptible contiguations which do not betray themselves easily to the eye. On the edge of the piazza is a goodly fountain beautified with statues, the water issuing out of the wolves' mouths, being the work of Jacopo Quercy, a famous artist. There are divers other public fountains in the city of good design. After this we walk to the Sapienza, which is the university, or rather college, where the high Germans enjoy many particular privileges when they addict themselves to the civil law. And indeed this place produced many excellent scholars, besides those three popes, Alexander, Pius II and III of that name, the learned Aeneas Silvius, and both were of the ancient house of the Piccolomini. The chief street is called Strada Romana, in which Pius II has built a most stately palace of square stone, with an incomparable portico joining near to it. The town is commanded by a castle, which hath four bastions and a garrison of soldiers. Near it is a list to ride horses in, much frequented by the gallants in summer. Not far from hence is the church and convent of the Dominicans, where in the chapel of St. Catherine of Siena they show her head, the rest of her body being translated to Rome. The Duomo, or cathedral, both without and within, is of large square stones of black and white marble, polished, of inexpressible beauty, as is the front adorned with sculpture and rare statues. In the middle is a stately cupola and two columns of sundry streaked coloured marble. About the body of the church, on a cornice within, are inserted the heads of all the popes. The pulpit is beautified with marble figures, a piece of exquisite work. But what exceeds all description is the pavement, where, besides the various emblems and other figures in the nave, the choir is wrought with the history of the Bible, so artificially expressed in the natural colours of the marbles, that few pictures exceed it. Here stands a Cristo, rarely cut in marble, and, on the large high altar, is a brazen vessel of admirable invention and art. The organs are exceeding sweet and well-tuned. On the left side of the altar is the library, where are painted the acts of Aeneas Silvius and others by Raphael. They showed us an arm of St John the Baptist, wherewith they say he baptised our Saviour in Jordan. 
it was given by the king of Peloponnese to one of the popes as an inscription testifies. They have also St. Peter's sword with which he smote off the ear of Malchus. Just against the cathedral we went into the hospital, where they entertain and refresh for three or four days gratis such pilgrims as go to Rome. In the chapel belonging to it lies the body of St. Susorius, their founder, as yet uncorrupted, though dead many hundreds of years. They show one of the nails which pierced our Saviour and St. Christostom's comment on the Gospel, written by his own hand. Below the hill stands the pool called Fonte Brande, where fish are fed for pleasure more than food. St. Francis's church is a large pile near which, yet a little without the city, grows a tree which they report in their legend grew from the saint's staff, which on going to sleep he fixed in the ground, and at his waking found it had grown a large tree. They affirm that the wood of it in decoction cures sundry diseases. 2nd November 1644 we went from Siena, desirous of being present at the cavalcade of the new Pope Innocent X, who had not yet made the grand procession to St John di Laterano. We set out by Porto Romano, the country all about the town being rare for hunting and game. Wild boar and venison are frequently sold in the shops in many of the towns about it. We pass near Monte Oliveto, where the monastery of that order is pleasantly situated and worth seeing. Passing over a bridge which by the inscription appears to have been built by Prince Matthias, we went through Buon Convento, famous for the death of the Emperor Henry the Seventh, who was here poisoned with the Holy Eucharist. Torinieri Thence we came to Torinieri, where we dined. This village is in a sweet valley, in a view of Montalcino, famous for the rare Muscatello. After three miles more we go by San Quirico and lay at a private osteria near it, where, after we were provided of lodging, came in Cardinal Donghi, a Genoese by birth, now come from Rome. He was so civil as to entertain us with great respect, hearing we were English, for that, he told us, he had been once in our country. Among other discourse, he related how a dove had been seen to sit on the chair in the conclave at the election of Pope Innocent, which he magnified as a great good omen, with other particulars which we inquired of him, till our suppers parted us. He came in great state with his own bedstead and all the furniture, yet would by no means suffer us to resign the room we had taken up in the lodging before his arrival. Next morning we rode by Monte Pientio, or as vulgarly called Monte Mantumiato, which is of an excessive height, ever and anon peeping above any clouds with its snowy head, till we had climbed to the inn at Radicofani, built by Ferdinand the Great Duke, for the necessary refreshment of travellers in so inhospitable a place. As we ascended, we entered a very thick, solid and dark body of clouds, looking like rocks at a little distance, which lasted near a mile in going up. They were dry, misty vapours hanging undissolved for a vast thickness and obscuring both the sun and earth, so that we seemed to be in the sea rather than in the clouds, till, having pierced through it, we came into a most serene heaven, as if we had been above all human conversation, the mountain appearing more like a great island than joined to any other hills. For we could perceive nothing but a sea of thick clouds rolling under our feet like huge waves, every now and then suffering the top of some other mountain to peep through, which we could discover many miles off, and between some breaches of the clouds we could see landscapes and villages of the subjacent country. This was one of the most pleasant, new, and altogether surprising objects that I had ever beheld. On the summit of this horrid rock, for so it is, is built a very strong fort garrisoned, and somewhat beneath it is a small town. The provisions are drawn up with ropes and engines, 
the precipice being otherwise inaccessible. At one end of the town lie heaps of rock so strangely broken off from the ragged mountain as would affright one with their horror and menacing postures. Just opposite to the inn gushed out a plentiful and most useful fountain which falls into a great trough of stone bearing the Duke of Tuscany's arms. Here we dined, and I, with my black lead pen, took the prospect. It is one of the utmost confines of the Etrurian state toward St. Peter's patrimony, since the gift of Matilda to Gregory the Seventh, as is pretended. Here we pass a stone bridge built by Pope Gregory the Fourteenth, and thence immediately to Aqua Pendente, a town situated on a very ragged rock, down which precipitates an entire river, which gives it the denomination, with a most horrid roaring noise. We lay at the post-house, on which is this inscription, L'insegna della posta e posta la posta, in questa posta, fin che habia a sua posta ogni un cavallo a vetturi in posta. Before it was dark, we went to see the monastery of the Franciscans, famous for six learned popes and sundry other great scholars, especially the renowned physician and anatomist Fabricius de Aquapendente, who was bred and born there. 4th November 1644. After a little riding, we descended toward the lake of Bolsena, which being above twenty miles in circuit, yields from hence a most incomparable prospect. Near the middle of it are two small islands, in one of which is a convent of melancholy capuchins, where those of the Farnesian family are interred. Pliny calls it Tarquiniensis Larcus, and talks of diverse floating islands about it, but they did not appear to us. The lake is environed with mountains, at one of whose sides we passed toward the town Bolsena, anciently Volsinium, famous in those times, as is testified by diverse rare sculptures, in the court of St. Christiana's church, the urn, altar, and jasper columns. After seven miles riding, passing through a wood, heretofore sacred to Juno, we came to Montefiascone, the head of the Falici, a famous people in old time, and heretofore Falernum, as renowned for its excellent wine, as now for the story of the Dutch bishop, who lies buried in St. Flavian's church with this epitaph, Procter est, est dominus meus mortuus est, because having ordered his servant to ride before and inquire where the best wine was, and there write est, the man found some so good that he rose est est upon the vessels, and the bishop, drinking too much of it, died. Viterbo From Monte Fiascone we travel a plain and pleasant champagne to Viterbo, which presents itself with much state afar off in regard of her many lofty pinnacles and towers. Neither does it deceive our expectations for it is exceedingly beautified with public fountains, especially that at the entrance, which is all of brass and adorned with many rare figures, and salutes the passenger with the most agreeable object and refreshing waters. There are many popes buried in this city, and in the palace is this odd inscription, O Cyridis Victoriam in Gigantas Literis Historiographicus in hoc antiquissimo marmore inscriptam, ex Hercules Olim, nunc divi laurenti templa translatum, ad conversanda vetustis patriae monumenta, at qui decora his locandum statuit SPQV. Under it, sum Osiris Rex, Jupiter Universo in Terrarum Orbe, Sum Osiris Rex, Qui Abitala in Gigantes Exercitis Veni Vidie Vici, Sum Osiris Rex, Qui Terrarum Paciata Italiam Decem Annos Quorum Inventor Fui. 
Near the town is a sulphurous fountain, which continually boils. After dinner we took horse by the new way of Capranica, and so passing near Mount Siminus and the lake, we began to enter the plains of Rome, at which side my thoughts were strangely elevated, but soon allayed by so violent a shower which fell just as we were contemplating that proud mistress of the world and ascending by the Vatican, for at that gate we entered, that before we got into the city I was wet to the skin. Rome I came to Rome on the 4th of November 1644, about five at night, and being perplexed for a convenient lodging, wandered up and down on horseback, till at last one conducted us to Monsieur Petit's, a Frenchman, near the Piazza Spagnola. Here I alighted, and having bargained with my host for twenty crowns a month, I caused a good fire to be made in my chamber, and went to bed, being so very wet. The next morning, for I was resolved to spend no time idly here, I got acquainted with several persons who had long lived at Rome. I was especially recommended to Father John, a Benedictine monk and superior of his order for the English College of Douay, a person of singular learning, religion and humanity. Also to Mr. Patrick Carey, an abbot, brother to our learned Lord Falkland, a witty young priest who afterward came over to our church. Dr. Bacon and Dr. Gibbs, physicians, who had dependence on Cardinal Caponi, the latter being an excellent poet. Father Courtney, the chief of the Jesuits in the English College, my Lord of Somerset, brother to the Marquis of Worcester, and some others, from whom I received instructions how to behave in town, with directions to masters and books to take in search of the antiquities, churches, collections, etc. Accordingly, the next day, November the 6th, I began to be very pragmatical, in the first place our sights man, for so they name certain persons here, who get their living by leading strangers about to see the city, went to the Palace Farnese, a magnificent square structure built by Michelangelo, of the three orders of columns after the ancient manner, and when architecture was but newly recovered from the Gothic barbarity. The court is square and terraced, having two pairs of stairs which lead to the upper rooms, and conducted us to that famous gallery painted by Augustine Caracci, than which nothing is more rare of that art, so deep and well studied are all the figures, that it would require more judgment than I confess I had to determine whether they were flat or embossed. Thence we passed into another, painted in chiaroscuro, representing the fabulous history of Hercules. We went out on a terrace, where was a pretty garden on the leads, for it is built in a place that has no extent of ground backward. The great hall is wrought by Salviati and Sucaro, furnished with statues, one of which, being modern, is the figure of a Farnese in a triumphant posture of white marble, worthy of admiration. Here we were shown the museum of Fulvius Orsinos, replete with innumerable collections. But the major domo being absent, we could not at this time see all we wished. Descending into the court, we with astonishment contemplated those two incomparable statues of Hercules and Flora, so much celebrated by Pliny, and indeed by all antiquity, as two of the most rare pieces in the world. There likewise stands a modern statue of Hercules and two gladiators, not to be despised. In a second court was a temporary shelter of boards over the most stupendous and never to be sufficiently admired torso of Amphion and Dirce, represented in five figures, exceeding the life in magnitude of the purest white marble the contending work of those famous statuaries Apollinius and Taurisco, in the time of Augustus, hewed out of one of entire stone and remaining unblemished, to be valued beyond all the marbles of the world, 
for its antiquity and workmanship. There are divers other heads and busts. At the entrance of this stately palace stand two rare and vast fountains of Garnito stone, brought into this piazza out of Titus's baths. Here in summer the gentlemen of Rome take the fresco in their coaches and on foot. At the sides of this court we visited the palace of Signor Picchini, who has a good collection of antiquities, especially the Adonis of Parian marble, which my Lord Arundel would once have purchased if a great price would have been taken for it. We went into the Campo Vacchino, by the ruins of the Temple of Peace, built by Titus Vespasianus, and thought to be the largest as well as the most richly furnished of all the Roman dedicated places. It is now a heap rather than a temple, yet the roof and volto continue firm, showing it to have been formerly of incomparable workmanship. This goodly structure was, none knows how, consumed by fire the very night, by all computation, that our blessed Saviour was born. From hence we pass by the place into which Curtius precipitated himself for the love of his country, now without any sign of a lake or virago. Near this stand some columns of white marble, of exquisite work, supposed to be part of the temple of Jupiter Tonans, built by Augustus, the work of the capitals being Corinthian, and architrave is excellent, full of sacrificing utensils. There are three other of Jupiter Stator. Opposite to these are the oratories or churches of San Cosmo and Damiano, heretofore the temples of Romulus. A pretty old fabric, with a tribunal or tolus within, wrought all of mosaic. The gates before it are brass, and the whole much obliged to Perboban the Eighth. In this secret place lie the bodies of those two martyrs, and in a chapel on the right hand is a rare painting of Cavalieri Baglioni. We next entered San Lorenzo in Miranda. The portico is supported by a range of most stately columns. The inscription cut in the architrave shows it to have been the temple of Faustina. It is now made a fair church and has an hospital which joins it. On the same side is San Adriano, heretofore dedicated to Saturn. Before this was once placed a military column, supposed to be set in the centre of the city, from whence they used to compute the distance of all the cities and places of note under the dominion of those universal monarchs. To this church are likewise brazen gates and a noble front. Just opposite we saw the heaps and ruins of Cicero's palace. Hence we went towards Mons Capitolinus, at the foot of which stands the arch of Septinus Severus, full and entire, save where the pedestal and some of the lower members are choked up with ruins and earth. This arch is exceedingly enriched with sculpture and trophies, with a large inscription. In the terrestrial and naval battles here graven is seen the Roman Aries, the battering ram, and this was the first triumphal arch set up in Rome. The capital to which we climb by very broad steps is built about a square court, at the right hand of which, going up from Campo Vacchino, gushes a plentiful stream from the statue of Tiber, in porphyry, very antique, and another representing Rome. But above all, the admirable figure of Marforius casting water into a most ample concha. The front of this court is crowned with an excellent fabric containing the courts of justice and where the criminal notary sits and others. In one of the halls they show the statues of Gregory the Thirteenth and Paul the Third, with several others. To this joins a handsome tower, the whole facciata adorned with noble statues, both on the outside and on the battlements, ascended by a double pair of stairs and a stately posario. In the centre of the court stands that incomparable horse bearing the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, as big as the life, of Corinthian metal placed on a pedestal of marble, esteemed one of the noblest pieces of work now extant, 
antique and very rare. There is also a vast head of a Colossian magnitude of white marble fixed in the wall. At the descending stairs are set two horses of white marble governed by two naked slaves, taken to be Castor and Pollux, brought from Pompey's theatre. On the balustrade, the trophies of Marius against the Cimbrians, very ancient and instructive. At the foot of the steps, toward the left hand, is that colonna miliaria with the globe of brass on it, mentioned to have been formerly set in Campo Vacchino. On the same hand is, is the palace of the Signori Conservatori, or three consuls, now the civil governors of the city containing the fraternities, or halls and guilds, as we call them, of sundry companies and other offices of state. Under the portico within are the statues of Augustus Caesar, a Bacchus, and the so-renowned Colonna Rostrata of Duilius, with the excellent Bassi Relivi. In a smaller court, the statue of Constantine on a fountain, a Minerva's head of brass, and that of Commodus, to which belongs a hand, the thumb whereof is at least an L long, and yet proportionable. But the rest of the coloss is lost. In the corner of this court stand a horse and lion fighting, as big as life, in white marble, exceedingly valued. Likewise the rape of the Sabines, two cumbent figures of Alexander and Mamea, two monstrous feet of a coloss of Apollo, the sepulchre of Agrippina, and the standard or antique measure of the Roman foot. Ascending by the steps of the other corner are inserted four basso relievos, viz. the triumph and sacrifice of Marcus Aurelius, which last for the antiquity and rareness of the work, I cause my painter Carlo Napolitano to copy. There are also two statues of the Muses and one of Adrian the Emperor. Above stands the figure of Marius, and by the wall Marcius bound to a tree, all of them excellent and antique. Above, in the lobby, are inserted into the walls those ancient laws on brass called the Twelve Tables, a fair Madonna of Pietro Perugino painted on the wall near which are the archives, full of ancient records. In the great hall are divers excellent paintings of Cavaliero Giuseppe d'Arpino, a statue in brass of Sextus V and of Leo X of marble. In another hall are many modern statues of their late consuls and governors, set about with fine antique heads. Others are painted by excellent masters, representing the actions of M. Scivola, Horatius Cocles, etc., the room where the conservatory now feast upon solemn days is tapestried with crimson damask embroidered with gold, having a state or a baldacchino of crimson velvet, very rich, the frieze above rarely painted. Here are in brass Romulus and Remus sucking the wolf of brass with a shepherd Faustulus by them also the boy plucking the thorn out of his foot of brass, so much admired by artists. There are also holy statues and heads of saints. In a gallery near adjoining are the names of the ancient consuls, praetors and fasti romani, so celebrated by the learned. Also the figure of an old woman, two other representing poverty, and more in fragments. In another large room, furnished with velvet, are the statue of Adonis, very rare, and diverse antique heads. In the next chamber is an old statue of Cicero, one of another consul, a Hercules in brass, two women's heads of incomparable work, six other statues, and over the chimney a very rare basso relievo, and other figures. In a little lobby before the chapel is a statue of Hannibal, a Bacchus very antique, bustos of Pan and Mercury with other old heads. All these noble statues, etc., belong to the city and cannot be disposed of to any private person or removed hence, but are preserved for the honour of the place, though great sums have been offered for them by diverse princes, lovers of art and antiquity. 
we now left the capital, certainly one of the most renowned places in the world, even as now built by the design of the famous M. Angelo. Returning home by Ara Curli, we mounted to it by more than one hundred marble steps, not in devotion, as I observed, some to do on their bare knees, but to see those two famous statues of Constantine in white marble, placed there out of his baths. In this church is a Madonna reputed to be painted by St. Luke, and a column on which we saw the print of a foot, which they affirmed to have been that of the angel, seen on the castle of San Angelo. Here the feast of our blessed Saviour's nativity being yearly celebrated with diverse pageants, they began to make the preparation. Having viewed the palace and fountain at the other side of the stairs, we returned weary to our lodgings. End of section 11